All right, guys. So um, this is me uh, and Jabe. Um, if you guys don't like my talk, you can anonymously give me feedback here. I've showed this, I think, to about 12,000 people now, and I haven't gotten anybody to write me anything yet. I'll have to, I'll have to practice getting bad or something. Um, Twitter, uh, the handle that we're using. So this talk, uh, I think, largely tries to address this particular problem um, that Bertrand Russell points out, which is that we, we tend to treat each other, we tend to treat other humans like uh, un incredibly unfairly because we expect them to be able to do things that they're not really able to do very well. Um, and we would never actually treat like machines and cars the way that we treat each other, which is, I think is strange, it's kind of backwards maybe. Um, so the talk, let, we're gonna explore really quickly what, what, what's the problem and what, 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 might, what might we do about that problem? So we're constantly faced with lots of uncertainty at work, uh, especially if we're doing knowledge work. Uh, part of the value of knowledge work is that we uh, directly confront and address uncertainty. Uh, if we're not kind of addressing uncertainty in knowledge work, we're probably not producing much value. Part of the, the value producing proposition of knowledge work is the discovery of new knowledge. So when we're faced with uncertainty, we like to make decisions. Um, and I think if we look at kind of the roots of decision making and the, even the term decision, um, decisions are, are often about making uh, settlements or agreements. And you know, this is partially because, uh, or, or I think the definition kind of starts to point out to us why we make decisions. Um, we want to settle disputes between ourselves. We want to feel more comfortable. Um, and, that's why we make decisions, is so that we can kind of move forward and feel comfortable. Um, but specifically, we, we make decisions in ways that they're very final. That's, that's part of the value of a decision, is that it's, it, it, it looks a lot like a commitment, something that we're going to commit to doing, so that we can stop talking about it and take action. Um, and this, this can be problematic um, for, for different, different reasons that we'll explore, uh, explore. But really, when we make decisions, we're looking for closure, and we're looking for commitment. So uh, all that uh, kind of the, the, the idea that we can use decisions to do this is based on a concept that we call the rational actor concept. Um, and the rational actor basically says that's, that we're capable of doing, making good decisions, that we're capable of making rational decisions. Um, and in fact, people who are not capable of making rational decisions uh, tend to be uh, crazy or uh, irrational or I insane. Um, and because of this, we kind of structure our organizations in a very specific way, which is uh, we try to promote the guy who's the most rational decision maker to the top of the organization, and then we try to funnel all the information to him so he can make these decisions. This is largely, again, about trying to reduce conflict within the organization and make sure that everyone can kind of work together nicely. And so. The problem with that is, is, is the, that it's all based on this idea of rational choice theory. And, it, and rational choice theory basically says that you can be rational, but only if you have access to perfect information and the amount of time you need to actually make a rational decision. And in fact, when we look at most humans, they're not very rational. Um, it, very rarely uh, do we make perfectly rational decisions. And there's actually two uh, kind of major th uh, kind of fields of thought about this. And the first one is, is by Herbert Simon, and he had an idea that he called bounded rationality. So assuming that we had perfect brains that could act like computers and kind of make perfect decisions all the time, we would still be bounded by our rationality based on the fact that we have limited access to information. So we don't have perfect information all the time. So we can't make the perfect decision because we don't have access to the information. Um, our cognitive abilities, and by this he means literally the, the amount of processing power we have. And finally, uh, we have a finite amount of time to make decisions. These three limitations significantly impact whether or not we make rational decisions. And so uh, in, in Herbert Simon's uh, ideas, he says basically what we actually have to do is, is create satisficing decisions. So decisions that are okay enough to move forward. There's another set of um, constrictions that we have to work under though, um, and this is more from Kahneman, and it's biased rationality. So 
In bias rationality, when we actually look at humans, we can measure the amount of irrationality they, they make in their decision making that is based purely on their cognitive abilities or their motivational influences. So they may prefer certain things over other things, or their brains may not allow them to make this, uh, certain types of uh, rational decisions. So when we're looking at decision making, we're looking at, at human beings that have a limited amount of information, a limited amount of time to do it, and, and not a very good computer program to actually make the decisions. So we can describe a rational decision, but it's very difficult to make a rational decision. There's some other problems. Um, with decision making inside organizations. One of the perfect example of it, this is a test. Has anybody heard of the jelly test before? The jelly test basically says, if I give you uh, one jar of jelly and I ask, are you satisfied with that jelly? Yeah. If I give you two jars of jelly and let you pick between the two, you'll be a little bit more satisfied. Three, you actually get relatively satisfied. Uh, now, if I give you 100 jars of jelly, so it looks like more options is better. But if you get 100 jars of jelly, most people actually just won't decide. They'll stop, right? So they actually don't make decisions. So there is a relationship between the number of options you have to choose from and your, your, your sense of satisfaction in being able to choose. So people with no choices demand more options. And on the other extreme, people with too many choices can't act, right? So there's this balance when we look at decision making of when we're giving people uh, things to decide about, we need to, we need to constrain them enough that they can actually make a decision, right? But we don't want to constrain them so much that they feel unsatisfied or, or um, that they're actually not responsible for the decisions. So that's kind of one jar of jelly or two jars of jelly, not really giving you a choice. So you don't feel responsible for it. And you don't feel satisfied by it. Another problem with decision making would be decision fatigue. So in the United States, um, this, is, this was a very disconcerting study. In the United States, they looked at judges, and it, uh, it, so they, look at per, they were looking at parole judges. So these are criminals who are uh, going up for a court case, and they're going to decide whether or not you can be released. Uh, you've been good. And they can look very, very uh, easily. In the morning, the judge tends to judge for the defendant. In the afternoon, the judge tends to judge for against the defendant. And there's a really simple reason for that. Because the judge chooses against the defendant if he, if he wants to choose the safe bet. Because putting a criminal back in jail for a term limit that he already has been sentenced for, no risk. Letting a defendant go who might do something bad, some risk. So he has to spend some time in the morning thinking, should I really let this guy go or not? And this actually d makes them very tired. Uh, and then they start making more and more default or bad decisions, right? So um, quite interesting. So if you're ever in the United States and you're on parole, make sure you're in the morning or feed, feed the judge a donut right before uh, he chooses because apparently the glucose spike also can help you make good decisions. But decision fatigue basically says we can only make so many decisions in one day. Um, well, so this is my, my, my favorite example of how we do this in software. How many of you guys uh, spend some significant amount of time prioritizing a very long backlog? Not anymore. <laughs> right? Just a, a repeated decisions over and over and over and over. Really important decisions for a couple hours, uh, half a day, a week maybe, or every two weeks. Uh, you're just, by the end of that meeting, everybody, literally everybody in that meeting is, is maybe even consciously thinking, I don't care anymore. But certainly, it, their intellectual capability is at the level where they will choose whatever the easy option is. They're just not capable of making decisions anymore. So this results in some very interesting behavior, all these kind of cognitive problems. And this is, this is, this is one that's pretty easily observable, which is that this is the preferred order that you'd like decisions to come out in, right? You, you, the preferred order is you'd like to be right. Right? And then if you're not right, you'd prefer to be uncertain. And finally, uh, if you have to be, you're wrong. Right? So this is really how you'd like it to be. But if you actually look at most people, their behavior indicates that this is not how they think at all. This is how they think. I'd rather be right, and then I'd rather be wrong and have made a decision so I can feel comfortable that the decision was made, even though it was wrong. 
than to remain uncertain and not have made a decision. So this is the type of behavior that we see a lot. And this has to do with the fact that when you look at, at, at decision fatigue, thinking consumes huge amounts of energy. So humans tend to try to conserve energy by making decisions and stop thinking. Just do something, right? So this type of behavior uh, is, is, is problematic. So there's another kind of problem that we see in organizations. I call this the problem of expertise. Um, the problem of expertise looks like this. You've got, everybody relatively gets this. You've got some boss. How many of you guys have a boss that doesn't really understand what you do? Like I, right? Um, so, so if you have this boss and he doesn't understand what two of his employees are doing and these two people have an agreement and they bring it to him to make a decision, how does he make a decision? I don't understand what you do. How am I supposed to decide which one of you are right? Right? So this is the problem of expertise. It becomes very challenging for executives and managers to make good decisions about experts. And it gets worse because that also happens across, not just up and down. Right? So your Java engineer and your d database administrator also don't know how to make decisions about what each other are thinking. Right? So this is the problem of expertise. And you know, in Agile, we generally try to solve this by saying everybody should be a generalist. Right? But if everybody's a generalist, then we don't get the, the, the value of having experts around. And it's not, it doesn't just really doesn't happen all the time, right? So this starts looking pretty scary at this point, right? Like centralizing all this decision making. So when we centralize all the decision making, this guy's got to make more decisions, so decision fatigue. Problems of expertise impact him, right? So there's all of these really significant problems that happen with this centralization. And David Snowden points out that it gets worse because he has these five different uh, kind of constraints on moving information around a social network, right? And so what he says is that knowledge can only be volunteered, it can't be conscripted, so I can't force you to tell me what you know. You just kind of have to tell me, right? We only know what we need to know when we need to know it. So for me, if you put me in a room and you ask me to program on a whiteboard with a, with a magic marker, I have a hard time doing it, but you put me in front of an IDE and I automatically know it. I have a context that I work in and I'm able to work in that context easily. If you take me out of that context and ask me what I know, I don't really know it anymore, right? Everything's fragmented, so we communicate e with each other through text messaging and tweets and all these things. And the reason that we're capable of doing it is because we've compressed all the information out of them. So if I send you a series of text messages between me and my friends, they will mean nothing to you guys. They're very fragmented. They're very small. Um, the way we know things is not the way we report we know things. So even if I can get you to volunteer the information, the way you describe what you do and how you actually do it often are significantly different. And we always know more than we can say, and we always say more than we can write. Uh, so uh, the classic ways of moving information around organizations, writing emails, wikis, these types of things, they actually don't, they're not effective ways of moving high fidelity information around an organization. So information, skill, and knowledge are embedded in networks and relationships. They, they're not owned by individuals. They're not objects that can be handed around in an organization. Um, and in fact, individuals, instead of owning that information, uh, the, the, the skill is actually knowing how uh, to find it, access it, and uh, manipulate it as it emerges around you, not, not that you own it, right? A um, Couple more problems, and then we'll go to how to solve things. Peter's principle, everybody knows Peter's principle? Have you heard this before? Or you get promoted up into the organization until you can't make good decisions, right? So the thing about Peter's principle is this. I think there's something that I call Peter's corollary. And so Peter's corollary says this. Everybody wants to do a good job at work, even the jerky bosses that, that everyone thinks are just jerks. So the result of that is when you get Peter principled, when you get promoted to a place where you can't make good decisions, Peter's corollary says that you show up at a layer down in the organization and start making decisions where you felt comfortable because it was the last place you were successful. So you can see managers appearing down a tier where they shouldn't be making decisions and making lots of decisions for everybody, right? Now this is, 
This is problematic, again, because of things like decision fatigue. Because if you were a manager of a team of 10 people and you were making decisions, and you get promoted up where you have access to 10 teams, now you're making 10 times as many decisions by stepping down into the org and making those decisions. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is also really problematic. And finally, um, the box packing algorithm. So in many organizations, we see this, this behavior, <coughs> which says that the way that we think about this, and, and we've seen several different presentations today that address this problem, but we, we tend to see organizations <coughs> put um, all of their work into boxes. We call them time boxes. And the goal of the time box ends up being, by default, how many things can you put in the time box? Not how much value you can deliver, but how many things can you put in it? And the ultimate way you know this is going very badly is when people start taking big stories and slicing them into smaller stories just to fit them into a box. Does that make sense? So they're making decisions that say, the thing that we should optimize for is getting the most amount of things done, as opposed to the most amount of value out of a system. And this can be very problematic, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you some of the ways of thinking about that. So obviously, the answer right, is, is distributed. You know, empower your teams and do distributed decision making, because yay, right? Um, but the problem is that when we look at many organizations, um, there's a disempowerment spiral that happens very quickly, where you empower people to make decisions. And then you step in, and the minute they make a bad decision, you come in and change their decision making which means that they know they aren't really empowered, so they step back out of that behavior and just start bringing you decisions to make again. So it's a negative feedback loop. So there's two things I think we need to look at in order to solve these problems. The first is, uh, where do we make decisions inside the organization? And the second one is, when do we make the decisions? You guys get a nice concert while I'm going. <laughs> Uh, and, and the first uh, way of addressing it, the where is, is what I call decision economies, and the when is what I call real options. So decision economies is based on this very simple idea which says that an economy is largely driven, driven by limited goods. There's no such thing as an economy with an infinite good, right? Like if you have an infinite good, there's no value to any of them. Um, so there have, you have to limit something in order to make it valuable. And one of my arguments is that in most organizations, people don't notice the decisions they're making at all. They're not mindful of the decisions they're making. They don't know how many they're making. And so if we layer in decision fatigue and all these other problems, they don't know how to value how many decisions they make in a day and therefore how, how to distribute the decisions around the organization. Um, in normal Kanban boards, we can see these decisions pretty clearly at the team level, right? So this guy has four decisions that he, uh, one decision he can make and four options. Um, and every time he finishes something, he gets an opportunity to make another decision. So he can actually pretty quickly get a good idea of how many decisions he makes in a day about the work and how many options he has. But most managers don't have access to this type of information because they don't use a Kanban system to make their decisions. Largely because uh, management is driven uh, by a pull system mostly, right? Like people come and ask you to make decisions, right? So if we could get managers to make more mindful decisions, uh, or we at least make managers or help managers um, figure out how many decisions they make a day, then we might be able to change their behavior. Um, and I have a simple heuristic uh, that I use that, with managers to help them do this. And the first thing to do is it's very hard to note every decision you make in a day, but you can start by noticing when you're asked to make decisions. So just keep a note of how many times you ask to make a decision. The way I do this with most executives is I ask them to keep a notebook or something in their pocket. And I ask them to draw a line down the middle of the page, and every time someone asks them a question, I'm going to put an X on one side or the other. So the first side would be um, an interesting question. So an interesting question would be something that you think you should be making a decision about. So something that you think is interesting, uh, something that uh, is appropriate for your level, something that's appropriate for the knowledge that you have, uh, the information you have access to. 
Um, so in general, these are things that make you go, huh, yeah, I, I, I didn't think about that. It's a good thing that you asked me, right? Um, the other one is this. So this is, you're going to put an X every time you have a, that was an interesting question. The next one is going to be, why, why did you ask me that? So I was a CTO in an organization, and I had a guy come to me as an example and ask me what kind of web server we should deploy on. And I put it over here. I helped him make the decision. So you, you, you don't want to stall and slow the, the decision making down. You can continue to help them make the decision. But this went over in this column. And it was be, it, because he should have been able to make that decision. So at the end of the day, questions that end up over here end up being an indication of how much uh, the system uh, is interfering with your decision making. So in other words, why did that guy feel like he wasn't safe enough in the organization to make the decision himself? And so then the question ends up being, how do I actually go into the organization and change the system around so that the decisions get, that I don't think I should be making get made at the appropriate level? So this is just a way of being mindful of those types of decisions. Um, I also encourage, at the end of the day, each uh, the executive to keep a journal, observe how many decisions they made a day, try to write down ones that they thought so they can remember about it. Um, journaling can be very helpful with that. So another part of this is, is, is making safe decisions. Okay? So one of the reasons that the systems fail, systems being work systems, uh, fail and cause decisions to be made in the wrong place, especially too high in the organization, is because people don't have ways of making safe decisions. So they feel as if, if they made a decision, they might know what decision they want to make, but they feel like they might be punished, or, uh, or, or, or an executive might come down and change their decision. Um, so it's not safe to decide. So they go up in order to get permission, as opposed to actually ask for information or, or new decisions. So I, I, I use uh, Mission Command, which is uh, Joachim talked a little bit about earlier. Um, this is the way that I teach Mission Command to people. Um, and you start at the top with the executives getting together and looking at quarters. I, I often try to get people to do uh, four to five quarters worth of strategy. Uh, so this is a, 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 period, a, a strategy that's going to last for a period of time. Um, and then uh, you work with the middle management to operationalize the strategy. So how it, within months, so usually uh, we try to get people to do this within about uh, six to nine weeks, uh, how are we going to create a series of operating strategies that, that inform or help us achieve the strategy itself? And then finally, uh, you go down to the team level and ask them to inform the operating intents via tactical intents. Uh, and then they can break things down into experiments and tasks. You'll notice uh, these kind of lines that go like this. This is both uh, about the time, so how long each of these are, but also about kind of how ambiguous they are. So this is up here has a lot of room for decisions to be made still, because it was all concrete planned out. There wouldn't be any decisions to be made. You have the same problems we're talking about. So this has to be strategic intense need to fit on a small page and describe what you want to achieve in, by setting boundaries, so saying what you, what, where you can go and where you can't go, and making sure everyone stays safe within the boundaries, and it, give a general direction of where you want to go. Uh, the operating intents obviously are the same thing, but smaller and smaller and smaller. So that by the time you're down here, this, these types of decisions can be made by pairs of people or by individuals, right? And they can be made safely uh, because the amount of time invested in making the decision and actually executing the decision is safe for most people. Um, if you spend a couple hours on a task and it turned out to be the wrong decision, nobody's going to really whack you too hard. But if you spend a couple months on the wrong decision, someone's going to be more upset. So the way I uh, help executives kind of think about how to know whether or not they've been effective at doing this. So ha have they actually um, imp implemented this in a way that was useful to their, their teams is, is to do Gemba walks. Uh, so Gemba walk means you're going to walk around, you're going to talk to the people uh, who are working, right? Um, 
By the way, don't do Gemba sits. I've seen these, like lots of executives are like, I go sit with the people. That doesn't count. Uh, you have to actually talk to the people. Uh, you can't just sit there and be present. Uh, and this is, these two questions are very powerful in relation to each other. Uh, what are you doing and why? So what are you doing? Uh, the answer might be, I'm, I'm fixing the login box for the, uh, for the main page. OK, why? And you will know that you have helped people make safe decisions if they can do this. They can pop the Y stack. They can trace the task to an experiment that they're doing. This is critical because the experiment automatically means they can fail. It's expected that they might fail. OK, so I'm doing this in order to figure out whether or not this thing works or not. And if that works, we'll know this tactic is going in the right direction. And if this tactic is going in the right direction, we're going to achieve this operating intent, which will inform our strategy. They can actually pop that Y stack for you and explain all the way up to the executive level why they're doing something. They feel safe. They understand why they're doing the work. If at some point they go, well, I'm doing this task for this experiment because Joe told me to do it. That means they don't feel safe. They're telling you that they, someone, they're using someone else's authority to make the decision. Does that make sense? So the subtle difference between those two can be very, very powerful for helping you guys understand uh, whether or not the teams are making decisions uh, and actually making distributed decisions or whether or not they're centralizing decisions into individuals and authority structures. So. Um, the other important thing that we see uh, about, about um, software and knowledge work is that, again, it's largely about cr creating information. And information really is the consumption of uncertainty. Does that make sense to you guys? So information is the resolution of what you're not sure of. That's what information is, right? Um, so software engineering knowledge work is literally uh, at the beginning, we got a bunch of stuff we don't know how to do, and at the end, we've resolved all those questions and it works. That's what we try to do. And we call this a, an information arrival process. And that means that there, it's, it, there's time. It's, it's a temporal process. It's not something that we can figure out before we start and then just kind of process like computing, right? We actually have to find out information. Um, and so we can look at it like this. Um, Last two times I've done this, I've done this right after David's talk, and he explains all this beforehand so I can shortcut. But I, this time I'm going to have to explain it to you a little bit. Uh, so instead of saying a deadline, uh, we can use what we call the cost of delay. So the cost of delay just says this is a curve. Uh, and it says, if we deliver it at this date, we'll get the maximum benefit. If we deliver it after this date, the cost of not having delivered it by that date goes up. So it, this is consuming the value of doing the work. Does that make sense? So it's, I, I just want to be clear, it's not a deadline. Uh, so so uh, if the green line, if the red line here is the deadline, the, the option point, the optimal option point, the green line here is the consumption of options. Does that make sense? So at the beginning of the project, we have lots of options. By the time the project is completed, we have to have consumed all of the options. We have to have explored them all and made them all go away. If there's leftover options, it means we've left value on the table. And so that means that there's this blue line which says, this is the optimal information arrival time. So as the, as the options go down, since we want to have information to inform our decisions, we need more and more information until a certain point, and then we need to have no more information left. So this is unfortunately what I see in a lot of projects, which is that the information arrival actually happens after the project's over, right? You find out you did the wrong thing. So all of the options that you consume may have been misinformed. So this results in this, right? Which is, at the start of the project, you make lots of relatively good decisions. And by the end of the project, you make more and more and more bad decisions because you've consumed all the options, you have less options left, and you don't have the information at the right period of time. So all of this area in here is uninformed speculative risk, right? So it means you had to make a decision without the information you wanted. Does that make sense? 
So what we want to do ideally in projects is move the information arrival backwards so that we can get more information earlier in the project. Now there's um, one uh, kind of warning here, which is we need to be careful about one thing. There's two types of uncertainty. One is uh, what we call aleatory uncertainty. And in aleatory uncertainty, uh, it's intrinsic. You can't remove it. So if you spend too much effort trying to remove risk that can't be removed or in, uh, try to resolve risk that cannot be resolved, you're just wasting effort. So you need to, to differentiate that from epistemic uncertainty. Epistemic uncertainty is the type of uncertainty that if we had more information, we would make better decisions. Um, and just for fun, uh, there's also uncertainty about what kind of uncertainty you have. Right? So it's kind of like there's turtles all the way down. Um, and a pro tip for people designing software organizations, uh, human systems always have some element of, of aleatory risk. And assuming infallibility is a guaranteed way to, to crash an organization. So there's these guys, uh, I have to read their names, I never remember. Uh, David Kirsch and Peter Magiallo uh, in 94 published a paper. Um, and what they did was they were looking at people playing Tetris. You guys know what Tetris is? Uh, it's an old game. What they were looking at is good players, pretty good players. What they would do, they would do eye tracking. They'd, they'd look at this piece, and they'd look to see if there was some place they could put it. And they kind of bounce back and forth like this. Now, this piece over here is the next piece that's going to come, and it would pop over here. And one of the things that they noticed is that very good players had a different strategy. When this piece popped in, they would spin it. They make it spin around, 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 right? And they just twiddle it. Now, the thing that they figured out was that there's two strategies that you could figure, use to figure out how to fit this piece into this board. The first one is you could look at the piece and then in your mind, rotate the piece around and try to see if you could find some place that it fits. So you'd be using your brain to move the thing around. The other way you could do it is spin it in real space to see if it fits, and you're just visually comparing then, right? You're not actually thinking, rotating in space. And that made significant improvements in the player's behaviors. And so this is the difference between what we call epistemic and pragmatic action. Is that like permanent feedback that I'm hearing? Um, so epistemic action is action that's intended to create information. It's not goal-directed action. Does that make sense? Pragmatic action is goal-directed. It means I know where I want to go, and everything I'm about to do will help me achieve that thing. So epistemic, that, that ap the appearance that they're spinning things around, that that's waste, that that's not, not rational behavior, it was just purely information gathering behavior. That's what we call this epistemic action. And so when we look at agile projects, this is the traditional way of explaining agile to, to groups. Like the, this is the, the waterfall version, right? Like you consume huge amounts of risk all in one big chunk. And so the, the, the agile uh, kind of proposition is that you break it into smaller pieces and then you consume value in increments, right? Well, with the epistemic idea, the other thing we could say is that not all of these things have to be pragmatic value. Some of them could be purely information-based value. That make sense? So when you're making, when you need to figure out how to make decisions, sometimes you're going to consume some of the effort simply to find out information, not to actually achieve a goal. And that's one way of making better decisions. So. This leads us to real options, which we talked about a little bit. Um, and uh, real options is very interesting. Uh, one of the things about real options is that people, we talked a lot about this at the beginning, right? People don't like uncertainty, right? And so one of the things that we do with real options is we bound the uncertainty. So if I told you, uh, based on all the stuff I told you before, you guys should stop making decisions. Does that, anybody's boss going to buy that? We should make less decisions, right? That's not, that's not a, a valid answer, right? But what if you went to your boss and you said things like, well, uh, we could bound how much time we're going to spend 
in make, doing, finding information. We need to do some research on this thing, some epistemic knowledge work, but we'll only do it for two weeks or three weeks, right? So we're gonna bound uh, the uncertainty with real options and I'll show you how we do that. Uh, we already reviewed this very quickly. Has anybody, was anybody not here for Pavel's talk? Okay, so I don't have to repeat all that. Here's, here's the big thing to get about real options. Uh, the difference between obligation versus a right. Okay, so an obligation is a commitment, right? So uh, if, I make, if I call up a hotel and I say I'd like a room and they take my credit card, do I have an obligation to show up? Do I have to go? So I have an option to go to the hotel. Does the hotel have an obligation to give me a room if I show up? So they have a commitment, right? So do you understand the subtle difference between an option and a commitment? The difference between a obligation and a right to do something. And really in real options, what we're trying to do is always take commitments and turn them into options, right? So we're trying to figure out ways of saying, instead of committing to do this, are there any other options we have other than this option? Because if we only have one option left, we're gonna have to commit to doing that. We have other options left, and we don't have to commit to doing this. We could do some research to figure out if it's going to work, and if it doesn't work, then we have other options. So that's that's the maybe critical part of real options. Um, and this is why, right? Uh, so this is the ultimate example of this. Uh, you know, if if the time it takes to recover is greater than the time you have uh, to survive, you'll die, which means you need more options. So the the, the classic IT example of this is. If you do a deployment and you can't roll back before the start of business, you're done. You don't have any options left. So one of the first most critical things to do is to figure out how to roll back in time. And of course, the, the thing that ends up happening with most organizations is that when they look at this I can't roll back problem, what they do is they try to put more and more and more effort into making perfect releases but that is that aleatory risk. There's no such thing as perfect releases. There's always gonna be a problem eventually, and if your system can't roll back in time for you to do business, you don't have the options of surviving anymore. So the question is whether or not you can compress that stuff. Um, so this is what we need to do, is we need to convert commitments into options. So obviously concepts like continuous delivery uh, and things like this, give us more options. It gives us more and more frequent attempts at, at, at deployment, but also the ability to uh, roll back and be in, in a safe place. Another um, critical thing, and this is about that box packing algorithm again, is that 100% utilization means no options. So when we talk about risk, right, we talk about this chance that something will happen, there's two chances that could happen, right? There's the chance that something bad could happen, there's also the chance that something good could happen. And if we've committed to doing 100% of all of our effort to something, and we have the opportunity to do something good, it pops up, then we don't have any capacity left to do the work, right? In the same way, if we are doing something 100% of the time, and we have something bad pop up, then all of a sudden we magically have to have those people who can do 100% of the work, 120%, right? They have to magically have 20% more capacity that they don't really have. So, given that there are no other options, if you have good information, uh, uh, sorry, and you don't have good information, uh, you're about to convert a, uh, an option into a speculative, uh, sorry, the speculative option into a commitment. So, that, this, that curve that I showed you guys, um, if you run out of time to get the information, then you're gonna have to make a decision without the information, which means that you've converted something that was an option into a commitment and it's speculative, you haven't informed it. So additional options can allow you to avoid speculative commitments. Now, uh, this I think is probably, if you looked at Pavel's um, three layers, this is like the second and third layer, not probably at the project layer. But you could think of options like this. There's three different ways to build the home page. One way will take this long, one way will take this long, one way will take this long. 
The traditional way of doing this is to line up from where you're starting and figure out which one's the shortest one to do and do that one first, right? Because this is the one uh, that we, you get the information back the fastest, right? So options would say you want to do it in a different way, which is line it up uh, on that curve that went like this where we figured out the optimal deployment date of the new landing page. Line these up, oops, sorry, against that. And then actually what you want to do is epistemic research to determine whether or not this is a valid option because that's the one that will expire first. And once it expires, you can't choose it anymore. But these things are in the future. So you don't have to choose them right now, right? So you want to focus most of the effort on determining whether three is a valid good option or not. Because once it's expired, you'll never be able to choose it again. Finally, uh, well not finally, finally about this particular point, uh, estimates are a function of duration and uncertainty, right? So. Uh, this is a real problem with estimation is that people tend to collapse uh, estimates, right? So most of the time when you ask for like story point estimation, it's like this thing where they say you combine how long it takes with the amount of complexity or something like that. But you get one number out of it and most people assume that number has to do with duration and not with uncertainty. With real options though, if you keep those two ideas separate, you can do this, which is the real question ends up can be, end up being things like, is the amount of uncertainty about the estimate, about the duration, can we consume that enough that this option actually becomes even shorter than option one and shorter than option two, right? So you can do two things when you're using real options to prioritize the consumption of work. The first is determine when, you'd ha when would I have to make a decision about this particular option. That's the option expiration date, right? And then ask which of these options am I, am I most uncertain about? And consume the options that have the highest amount of uncertainty and will expire the soonest. Does that make sense? All right. And that's how you shift this kind of information curve so that you can make better decisions. So here's a really quick uh, flow chart of how to use real options to make decisions. How, how, do I have what, 10 minutes left? Is that right? Eight minutes, thank you. So, uh, if you're making a decision, there, these are the three things that you could do with the decision. You could turn it into a commitment. So you could say, I am going to do it. You could turn it into an option. I am interested in doing it, but I'm not committing to doing it. Uh, or I like to have the right to do it, but I don't want to have an obligation to do it. Or you could just defer the decision. So you say, I'm not going to actually make it, I'm not going to choose it at all. So if you uh, make a commitment, then you need to use pragmatic action to achieve your end result, which you should define with success criteria. This is traditional project management, right? If instead you'd like to turn it into an option, you'd like to pursue epistemic action. So you'd like to pursue research and trying to figure out what works. You like to consume uncertainty as much as possible. And what you need to define is the expiration point of that option. When will I have to decide whether this is an option or not, right? Uh, and you need to define the expiration criteria for that. Um, and finally, you know, expiration criteria could be you run out of money, you run out of time, uh, you need the resources somewhere else. Um, and this bounds the option which, uh, which reduces the stress involved with the uncertainty. So some very quick conclusions and then I will take a few questions. Temporal and social distance between relevant information and those making decisions impact the quality, efficiency, and timeliness of decisions. So the farther the information has to move in an information graph or in a social network, uh, the, the longer it will take to make the decision and the less quality that will be. So you'd like to distribute information appropriate, you'd, you'd like to distribute decisions towards the information required for those decisions to be made, which is not always down, sometimes it can be up. More options, more value, more time, more information, more information, and more options makes better decisions. Be mindful of how your systems drive decision making in your organizations. Uh, make safe uh, structures for people to make decisions against, including things like um, mission command statements, uh, strategy uh, intents. 
bound uncertainty in order to create more options and defer commitments when possible. These are my, uh, my inspirations. Uh, commitments, great book, other books, and that's me. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Or are you guys exhausted? <laughs> yes. So, so I don't know if the question is a point which I think that just growing software values to be the same law. Talk about not needing to make decisions every day. And uh, when the training uh learning core officers in the United States to teach them that they get out of the default spelling that's to the name. Yep. And that they should figure out how to run the Marine Corps with no more the balls per officer per day. Yep. Uh, and when uh, people who do that training encounter people like me from proper life, they'll ask things like, so how much email do you get? People will say, well, 400 emails per day. And do you reply to all of Sure. And they think an email is like a memo, it's like giving an author and they'll how can you send 400 memos every day? Right. right. So th these military guys think that corporate people are obviously very dumb. Right. You know? But it's very difficult to get to that level of rigor to realize that if you're only going to give the orders per day, you actually need to delegate a huge amount of authority. Yep. I think, I think there's two things. One, um, moving information as we described is hard. So if you actually make significant decisions in your organization, Literally just communicating that decision into the organization doesn't happen via magic. Right? It's not like I have an, an idea and it just goes into everyone's head. You have to actually spend some time to make that decision clear uh, and, and, and send it out into the organization. The other part about it is that because of the same problem, because it takes a long time to get information into an organization, if you decide you've made the wrong decision, it's going to take a long time to retract it. Right? So. Distributing decision making across the organization and making sure you distribute the right kinds of decisions to the right level in the organization is critically important, right? Executives know things that line managers don't know. Executives need to make decisions about that information. They don't need to make decisions about stuff that the line managers know about. And actually figuring that out and paying attention to, should I be making this decision? And how can I tell this person that I'm working with that they should have made that decision. That's just critical for us to be better at speeding up our cycle times and making decisions that actually uh, impact our businesses. It feels good to make a decision, by the way. Most managers spend most of their time doing nothing but making decisions. A nice little dopamine pop every time you make a decision, even if you never get a reward for it. Because making the decision is a reward in and of itself. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jay.